Hi, Jean Schnupp here. Welcome to another of the new Savvy Sightseer video vacation series. Today we are off to the Republic of Ireland. I've been lucky to have family in Ireland and so the opportunity to visit several times. There's no tour guide better than family members who want to show off their country. But no matter how often I've been back, I've never forgotten the first time I flew in. What struck me most then was the unending shades of green. There is no Crayola box that could hold them all, and it's no wonder it's called the Emerald Isle. Johnny Cash wrote the popular song, Forty Shades of Green. The idea came to him as he looked down while flying over Ireland. Ireland is a magical island, just about 175 miles wide and 300 miles long, roughly the size of Indiana. It is packed with beauty, isolated moors, bustling cities, coastal towns, and thousands of years of history, and just as many myths, legends, and stories. As someone who is mostly Irish, I don't want to hear any snickering about our legends and superstitions. From Dublin to Bunratty, the Republic of Ireland's sights are as varied as its many shades of green. We're going to start today with an incredible sight that even frequent visitors to Ireland are not familiar with. Then we'll swing through Dublin before branching out for the Midlands and a stop off at my absolute favorite tiny town. Then we'll finish with the amazing views along the Atlantic seaboard. So with the wind at your back and the sun shining warm upon your face, let's tour the Emerald Isle. In the Boyne Valley near Ireland's capital city, Dublin, you find Newgrange. It dates back over 5,000 years to about 3200 BC which means it's older than Stonehenge and the Great Pyramids of Giza, and yet so few people I've met know anything about it. Newgrange is a large circular burial mound, about 250 feet across and 40 feet high, and covers a little more than an acre. Newgrange was discovered, excavated, and restored between 1962 and 1975. Fans of the Celtic woman might recognize the name as the title of one of their songs. Newgrange is considered the finest example in all Western Europe of a tomb known as a passage grave. That's a burial chamber reached by a long straight passage lined with stones. It is ringed by 97 large curb stones, the most famous of which marks the entrance under the root box. It is about 10 feet long and 4 feet high. What makes it so distinctive is the unusual triple spiral etchings and that qualifies it as Europe's largest and most important concentration of prehistoric megalithic art. No one is quite sure what is behind these spirals. Some speculate it represents an ancient Celtic symbol. The Irish are big on the power of three, and the three-circle Celtic spiral knot is one of the very oldest Celtic designs. They could symbolize the forces of nature, like water, fire, and earth, or possibly phases of life, birth, life, death, or past, present, future. Or perhaps they're purely decorative doodles drawn by an ancient someone who was just plain bored. No one knows for sure its significance, but what they do know is that at the dawn of the winter solstice in late December, the main chamber is illuminated by a beam of sunlight that cuts directly through the entry into the chamber for about 17 minutes. The alignment is too precise to happen by chance making this the oldest surviving, deliberately aligned structure in the world. What's perhaps the most spectacular feature is that the roof of the inner chamber hasn't leaked in 5,000 years, something that intrigued me since my house is already on its third roof. And stop and think about it. Who would have been around to build it? Farmers? Hunters? Gatherers? Somehow they were also experts in engineering, geology, art, and even astronomy? Some contend aliens paid a visit and built it. In March 2015, a canoe was found by two fishermen on the nearby Boyne River. Archaeologists have dated it and say the boat was likely used to bring stone to construct the tomb. There are other burial chambers in the region, but not nearly as dramatic as at Newgrange. A little north of Newgrange, at the Hill of Tara, there are burial chambers that date back to about 2000 B.C. The Hill of Tara played an important role in Celtic history. For centuries, it was the meeting place or seat of the High Kings of Ireland. This pillar of rock called the Stone of Destiny was key when new Irish kings were crowned. Legend has it that the king wannabes proved their worthiness through a series of challenges, and when the rightful candidate touched it, 
the stone was said to signal the winner by emitting a scream heard throughout the island. A common sight all around the country is the Celtic cross, a traditional symbol of Ireland. It's a cross chiseled from stone with a circle around the intersecting branches. It's ubiquitous, but shrouded in mystery. Are these thousands years old pagan symbols or were they introduced in Ireland by St. Patrick in the fifth century? In pagan times, the four points could have symbolized compass points, north, south, east, or west. Or maybe the elements of nature, earth, wind, fire, and water. Or perhaps the components of man, mind, body, soul, and heart. Or Christians say they are symbols of the crucifixion. The circle could reflect the sun, the moon, undying love, eternity, or cycle of life in pagan times. Or in Christian times, it could have been representative of a halo. It could also be as simple as a stabilizer for the structure, or just simply pretty to look at. Likely, it's emerged between pagan sun icons and Christian cross symbols. It is generally believed that these were originally laid flat on the ground, and later on, Christians turned them upright to mark where a priest would be preaching. Some have elaborate designs or decorations embedded, others are plain. One thing that struck me going around the cities was how colorful the house fronts are and how impeccably neat they are. Turns out this was not by accident. The brightly colored houses across Ireland date back only to 1958. Before that, most Irish houses were plain stone or whitewashed. A tidy town contest encouraged Irish towns to compete to see who could have the most colorful and tidy. And today, the bright colors are the norm. The rivalry became an annual event. In 2019, a record number entered, and 918 towns and villages throughout the country competed. Glaslow, near the border with North Ireland, was announced the overall winner, while Blackrock in County Louth took the prize of Ireland's tidiest small town. You can't go to Ireland and not experience an Irish pub. Dublin has the highest number of bars in the Republic. The best place I found there that defines an Irish pub is the Merry Plowboy. Here you can try the beer and local dishes and learn about traditions and enjoy the songs and dances. The Merry Plowboy has repeatedly been named the best traditional dinner slash entertainment event in Ireland. For about 30 years, the band has owned and managed the traditional pub, the first and only band to do so. See some of the action for yourself. During British occupation, the Irish weren't permitted to practice their own cultural traditions, their dance, they weren't allowed to play their own music, or speak even the Irish language. The Irish figured they could still get away with dancing as long as their upper body didn't appear to be moving. That led to step dancing. So if a member of the British authority glanced into a window of a bar or house and saw someone bopping about the place with stationary arms, it would seem as though the person was just walking and not dancing. Even bagpipes that could be played while standing were banned, so they developed one that could be used sitting down. Nearby Trinity College was created by royal charter in 1592 by Queen Elizabeth I, primarily as a Protestant college. Today, it's one of Ireland's most prestigious colleges, open to men and women of different religions, and it is recognized internationally as one of the top 1% of universities in the world. Many famous writers graduated from Trinity. Oscar Wilde, Jonathan Swift, James Joyce, Samuel Beckett, Lord Tennyson, A.A. A. Milne, and Abraham Stoker, author of Dracula. Bram Stoker said the real-life inspiration for Dracula's mannerisms were from a friend of his, the actor Sir Henry Irving. And he was inspired not by Vlad the Impaler, as some people contend, but rather by the early Irish legend of an evil chieftain who, after being betrayed by his subjects, rose from his grave every night to drink the blood of his subjects. Trinity houses a world-renowned library with over four million volumes. This is the Long Room, and it houses 200,000 of the library's oldest books in its oak bookcases. It is aptly named. It's about 
210 feet long and 40 feet wide. I felt smarter just walking through it. The most famous tome here is the Book of Kells, this elaborately detailed, handwritten and illustrated manuscript of the four Gospels of the New Testament reportedly dates back to the 9th century when it was painstakingly produced by Irish monks. The stunningly beautiful book is one of Ireland's most precious artifacts and is generally considered the finest surviving illuminated manuscript to have been produced in medieval Europe. And the good news is you don't have to go all the way to Dublin now to see it for yourself. It is now available digitally online, and there's a link to it on the Dublin section of my website. Dublin is Ireland's largest and most populous city. Today, over a million people, roughly a quarter of the country's population is there. The city is a contradiction of old and new, modern and historic, bustling streets and quiet parks like this one. Once a rundown private park, St. Stephen's Green was converted in 1880 by beer baron Sir Arthur Guinness into what is now Ireland's best-known Victorian public park. After renovating, he had opened it to the city residents of Dublin. The park provided moments of calm in 1916 during the Rising as twice a day fighting on both the Irish and British sides was stopped to allow the park warden to feed the ducks. He had refused to let a revolution endanger his rare breed of ducks and secured the ceasefire for an hour a day so he could feed his precious fowl. In the mid-1700s, and I absolutely love this committee's title, the commissioners for making wide and convenient ways, streets, and passages in the city of Dublin was created and the goal of making Dublin a prestigious and pretentious city was realized. They believed a uniform look would bring a certain grandeur to the civic spaces of the city. That demand for uniformity gave rise to Georgian squares, like the one around St. Stephen's Green. They had elegant houses that ringed around the common area. Typically, the architecture design was for attached five-story houses with terraces. These were lived in by British aristocrats, and while they were almost exactly the same on the outside, Inside, the owners could do what they wanted, and some had magnificent ceiling plasterwork, ornate fireplaces and staircases. Outside, the only way to set themselves apart was to be able to paint their front doors in lively colors or add ornate knockers, elegant fan lights, and wrought iron boot scrapers near the entrance. Drawn by the colorful entryways in 1970, an American photographer took pictures of them to make a collage for himself. His friend, Joe Malone liked it and wanted to hang it in his Irish tourism office window on St. Patrick's Day, where parade go goers could pass. The Irish tourism board saw commercial potential there and commissioned the posters, which did entice tourists and became an award-winning poster. In the years after gaining self-rule in 1922, an independent Ireland had little sympathy for Georgian Dublin, seeing it as a symbol of British rule. And so over half the Georgian buildings on St. Stephen's Green have been lost. Many were demolished in the 1950s and 60s. The best concentration of remaining homes are around Fitzwilliam and Parnell Squares. When looking at a map and seeing that Ireland is at roughly the same latitude as Newfoundland, some people are confused by the vast difference in their climates. Winters in Ireland are much milder and fueled by warm ocean currents from the tail end of what's known as the Gulf Stream so the countryside is lush and dotted with farm and grazing lands. The temperate weather gives it magnificent growing seasons, which provides uniquely fertile grazing fields that produces rich cow's milk for a very tasty and creamy butter and cheese. Despite knowing about the Gulf Stream, I was still surprised to see palm trees in my ex-husband's cousin's yard. Cabbage palms are able to thrive in Ireland because of those warm ocean currents. Cousin Carol definitely has a green thumb, and her yard is typical of an Irish garden. They are low in maintenance and fuss, but big on color and diversity. My mother-in-law had a beautiful one in her yard in Nassau County here. I tried, but mine just turned out looking like a bunch of weeds. To see the best of Ireland's gardens, you have to visit Powers Court. Richard Wingfield, a 16th century English-born army officer, was rewarded for his success in crushing an Irish rebellion. He was given the title of Viscount and the roughly 40-acre Powers Court estate, along with its 14th century castle. The title died with him, 
but the family was able to keep the land. A descendant, coincidentally also a Richard, was reawarded the title and set about to make his mark and assert his position as one of importance in society. He transformed the medieval castle into a grand 68-room mansion. He completed it in 1741. In 1961, the estate was sold by the ninth Viscount to Ralph Schlesinger, the head of a wealthy sporting goods family. Wendy, Ralph's daughter, later married the 10th Viscount, so the house and Viscount line are still connected. The manor was completely gutted by fire in 1974 and sat as a shell until 1996 when it was fully restored. Powers Court has been named one of the top 10 houses and mansions worldwide by the Lonely Planet Guide. Fortunately, the inside had been used before the fire for the Ryan O'Neill movie Barry Lyndon, which lets you actually see what it had looked like in all its glory. Today, it is largely used for offices and shops and as a popular movie backdrop and catering venue. Powers Court has a stunning view of Sugarloaf and the Wicklow Mountains. The estate is still owned and run by the Slazinger family and now totals about 47 acres, much of which are devoted to different types of gardens, formal walled gardens, shaded ponds, and this Italian-style garden, which is highly stylized but markedly functional. It has certain key elements, the patio, the flower beds that are bordered by hedges, superb sculptures like the winged horse at the end of the, the walk, and a pond or water element. The landscape here is a sprawl of careful design to showcase man's control of nature. The terraces from the house to, to the lake took about 12 years to build with over 100 laborers. National Geographic has named Powers Court as the number three best garden in the world. It also has the longest herbaceous border walk in Ireland with over 700 varieties of herbal and other perennials. My favorite type of garden on the estate is the Japanese garden. This is a place of subtlety, one of contradictions and imperatives. It is designed in a series of circles. The concept behind each of these circles is when walking, working your way inwards, we discover our inner selves. Working outwards and upwards, we gain greater knowledge of the world around us. The pathway is symbolic of the journey through life, and even specific stones in the path may have meaning or purpose. A much wider stone set across the path tells you to put your feet there and stop and take a look of the view. A gap in the hedges gives you a glimpse beyond to the outer world. Raked gravel signifies water. There's also a real stream. The sight and sound of its inexorable flow are there to remind us of the relentless passage of time. A bridge often crosses the water, symbolic of moving from one world into another. The Powers Court waterfall is Ireland's highest at almost 400 feet, and this was the main draw for Schlesinger. He wanted his own waterfall. I found this to be the perfect setting in which to enjoy a spot of Irish tea and scones, this is Jer Point Park Farm in Kilkenny. While lamb stew is the national dish of Ireland, sheep also played an important part in the Irish economy and culture for their wool. The Irish knit sweater is a distinctive cream-colored heavy sweater, originally developed on the Aran Islands on the West Coast. Each part of the design told a story and was distinctive to the region. Fishermen's ropes stitches signified a fruitful day at sea. The diamond stitch was for the small fields of the islands and a wish for success and wealth. The zigzag stitch, or half diamond, represented the twisting cliff paths on the islands. The Irish wool industry was at its peak in the 17th and 18th century, but there are some mills still around, such as Cushendale near Kilkenny, that our family operated and have been for over 200 years. In brilliant contrast to Ireland's greens is gorse, bright yellow shrubs that can be found in roughy grassy areas, along walls, and in many fields. Its flowers are edible, though their thorny stems present a challenge to gathering them. The flowers have a light coconut aroma and an almond taste. They are used to make tea and yellow wine, and the buds can even be pickled in vinegar, then used as capers in salads. And for even more contrast, there are these big, bleak-looking fields. These are peat bogs. Fossilized earth harvested as an important source of fuel. They have 
also been excellent preservers of anything that happens to have been in them. Some mighty strange things have been found in these. A thousand-year-old book of Psalms, an oak barrel weighing 77 pounds and full of well-preserved 3,000-year-old butter. And then there's the body of a man who died somewhere between 362 and 175 B.C. This little town was made popular through song, Bing Crosby's Christmas in Killarney. It's a picturesque town and a popular stopping off place for people visiting the Ring of Kerry. That's a 111-mile tourist route through southwest Ireland. But it has plenty of beauty in its own right. A short walk from the town center takes you to Killarney National Park. Ireland's oldest national park covers about 26,000 acres. Along the way, you'll pass the elegant St. Mary's Cathedral. Construction began in 1842, but was interrupted by the arrival of the Great Famine, during which time the partially built cathedral was used as a shelter for the sick and dying. It was finally finished in 1912. Also in Killarney National Park is Ross Castle, a 15th century tower and keep believed built by one of the O'Donoghue Ross chieftains. It is considered a typical example of the stronghold of an Irish chieftain during the Middle Ages. The castle sits on the edge of Lower Lake. Legend hold that Clan Chief O'Donoghue was somehow sucked into the lake along with his white steed. The two of them reportedly sometimes ride again on the first day of May and make a circuit before disappearing again into the lake. A herd of rare red deer has its home in the National Park. Red deer are Ireland's largest land mammals and the only native deer species to Ireland. They are believed to have had a continuous presence in Ireland since the end of the last ice age. There are only about 700 of them left and so now they are a protected species. Also in the park you'll see a typical thatched cottage. This one is now a tea room. For an extensive taste of life in bygone eras, my favorite little town of Bunratty near Shannon Airport has that covered. The beautifully restored 15th century Bunratty Castle is billed as the most complete and authentic medieval fortress in Ireland. Inside, Bunratty Castle is beautifully appointed and the rooms fully restored. We have a fake medieval times restaurant, but they have the original experience of mingling with the lords and ladies of the day over a four-course dinner in the castle's immense banquet hall, amid the lilting tunes of Irish medieval and traditional songs. Here, have a listen. <laughs> Massive tapestries like you see on the wall here serve multiple purposes, from just brightening up the decor to telling a story and keeping the place warm from dress. Adjacent to the castle is a recreated 19th century village like our old Bethpage, where life goes on much as it did 200 years ago with well-informed actors and historians. You find some homes were very different from today's, like this buyer dwelling that was occupied by both humans and their cows. Milking cows needed to be kept indoors when it got too cool at night for them. So it may have been a bit smelly, but I guess it was quite a short work commute the next day. Bunratty means bottom or end of the Ratty River, which flows alongside the castle on its way to join the River Shannon, Ireland's longest river. This inn, next to the river, was also a toll collecting place, and innkeeper Nellie ran both operations. Legend has it that when she was asleep one night, she envisioned a recipe for a new whiskey and subsequently developed one of Ireland's best-loved secret brews, poteen, like Irish moonshine. She made it in a still in the woods. It was said to have healing powers, provided virility and energy. But it was eventually banned because its alcohol content was roughly double standard spirits, between 80 and 90 percent. A reduced alcohol content version is today made at the town's distillery. One of the most beautiful pieces of shoreline can be found on Ireland's western coast. Here, the Cliffs of Moher, with a peak of about 702 feet, stretches like fingers from five miles along the Atlantic. At the cliff's highest point is O'Brien's Tower, 
was built in 1835 by Cornelius O'Brien, a descendant of one of the last high kings of Ireland. He planned it as a viewing point and party place, <laughs> but he didn't take some things into account, like the blasting storms off the Atlantic or the buffeting winds and that potential 700-foot drop for his partygoers. So he moved the parties inland to another castle. But O'Brien saw the tourism potential and opened the tower to attract Victorian visitors. His care and expense made the Cliffs of more accessible, safe, and attractive to visitors, and made him popular with his tenants, whom he kept working when little else was available before and especially during the famine. He was less popular, though, with the other landlords. Records indicate that he said that they should waive rent for their tenants and suggested they buy bread for their families to eat. The cliffs are said to be featured in more films than some movie stars. Some you might recognize them in are Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, Sense and Sensibility, and The Princess Bride. The Cliffs of Moher are consistently at the top of Ireland's most visited places, and I believe that's deservedly so. They are also a popular nesting place for about 30,000 pairs of birds. This spot in Ireland is popular with a creature less associated with the country. From the end of March until mid-July, Goat Island becomes home to the largest mainland colony in Ireland of the arguably cutest bird, the Atlantic Puffin. This was designated a special protection area under the European Union Birds Directive in 1986. More recently, another inhabitant has come under protection by an EU directive. Leprechauns. The little people and their heritage are protected by a European Union directive enacted in 2011, thanks to a group of lobbyists from Carlingford County Luth. A committee member remarked, we are delighted in the knowledge that our little people will be protected from extinction and allowed to thrive on the mountains. And as you notice, it says, hunters and fortune seekers will be prosecuted. Just a little sideline, May 13th is National Leprechaun Day in Ireland. I like to end all of my programs with the words of Dr. Seuss that sometimes you don't appreciate the moment until it becomes a memory. I like to add to that to always remember to celebrate the moments and treasure the memories. To see more of Ireland or any of my European destinations, go to my website. If you have any questions about this program, email me or use the contact page on my website. When libraries are again offering programs, you can check my programs tab to see where I'll be. Until then, Visit the library site for more video vacations by Savvy Sightseer. Stay healthy, stay home. I'll leave you with an Irish blessing. May good and faithful friends be yours wherever you may roam.